Welcome back to Play Tessie. It's episode 46. If you're listening on drop day, the hell month of February is over. You're on to March. And that is why this is the official podcast of being the exact same month as opening day is played. It's episode 46. It's the John Shriver episode. Friend of the program. He might be pitching for the Royals, but we still love Johnny Shriver. He's the man. Uh, but this is also known as the official Red Sox podcast of WEI. We've got a good interview today. We're, we're having a great conversation with Joe Wild does the pre and post with WEI. Really good Sox talk, some sort of season preview vibes to it. Uh, but before we get into that, remember, hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Odyssey app. Hit that subscribe button, rate us five stars, and leave a comment. Uh, if you're on YouTube, hit that thumbs up. Uh, subscribe to WEI. We've got our own playlist there. Uh, doing great things there. Leave a comment there, too. Engage, man. Follow us on Twitter, at Playtessie, at, on Instagram, at Playtessie. Me, Sammy, and Pat here with Coop in the background, joined by Joe Weil shortly. Uh, let's just jump right into it, man. We got it. We got a good interview here, so good, good conversation, so we're going to jump right into it. We're joined by Joe Weil. He does the pre and post on WEI. We are also WEI, so we're partnering up. We got a good show for you guys today. Joe, how are you doing? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, no, we uh, it, it felt right because it we're going into March. It's not March right now, but if you're listening, it's March, which is which is freaking great because I despise February. February, I think, is like the worst month of the year. So Absolutely. you're on to the other side, and I think it's appropriate that we start to preview this season. So the Red Sox are at spring training. The games have started. You've seen what what is what are some things that you've seen that I guess you think people can look forward to this season? Well, I, I think the young guys to start and Roman Anthony being in the lineup, getting a chance to, to have him in some spring training lineups and, and actually delivering on some of what we saw last year is, is pretty enticing. And I, I don't expect to see him in, in 2024, but at the same time to know that he's a guy that's on the horizon is, is something that's, that's pretty exciting to think about, you know, along with Marcelo Meyer and Kyle Teal, I do think that the future with the position player prospects is bright. The one thing I, I, I'm continuously keeping an eye on is, is that battle for the, the fifth spot in the starting rotation. And I've leaned different ways with certain guys. And, and you know, I, I know you guys have talked about it a lot. This could all be rendered moot if they just signed Jordan Montgomery, that we don't have to rely upon, you know, a Garrett Whitlock or, or a Tanner Howick or Josh Winkowski to be that fifth starter. But for the time being, that's a spot that needs to be filled. So who's going to win that spot? And I think all of them have a, have a case. I, I've been particularly intrigued by Alex Cora talking up Josh Winkowski because I thought after what he did in the bullpen last year that that was just going to be his long-term future after what we saw from him you know, in the starting role in 2022. But he's he's getting a shot, and, and at least he pitched well last time out. And so we'll see how it shakes out. But that's that's – Two of the things I've been looking at in spring training are how these young prospects performing, and then along with Sadon Rafaela, and if he's going to earn himself a spot in in the uh, the opening day uh, roster as well. I think there's a lot of interesting things. I know people are down on the team. I, I understand it, but I'm such a baseball lover. I'm so intrigued by how this team's going to develop. You know, the the prospects, but also the young guys that are still trying to really cement themselves in the major leagues. Even guys that have had some success, but to to sustain it. So. We'll see how it shakes out, but but those specific things are the, are the things in spring training that I've been keeping my eye on the most. So we're definitely going to come back to the Rafaela conversation, but before that, who do you think has a lead for that fifth starter spot? We heard you mention the three names. Good it's question. Hauk, Whitlock, Winkowski. We had a debate, I think two, three episodes ago, and all three of us picked someone different. So Joe, who's your pick for the lead? Not who you want. But who do you think is in the lead? This is good. He's the tiebreaker here. I like this. All right. All right. So my gut, Tanner Houck. And so Sammy had that one. Yeah. There we <laughs> go. Hold on. Hold on. Give me two answers, though. It, it, I agree Houck, I think, has the lead. I would pick Whitlock. Who would you pick if, if, if you were making the call? I think I would go with Houck, but I still oh, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Great choice. Just seeing the disappointment on the, the right side of my screen. Your mic dropped out. You see Winkowski? <laughs> <laughs> so, right, right. Um, I mean, I'm going to be honest. I, I don't feel particularly great about any of the three as starters. I think they're all major league pitchers. And 
you go one by one, you know, how obviously as he continues to go in and, in and outing third time around, we know, we know the issues there, right? With Garrett Whitlock, it, the, the injury stuff is what scares me. And, and I think we've now had back-to-back years of him being compromised. And it's, it's a shame in a lot of ways because of how good he was in 2021. Like the Red Sox don't make, they don't make it to the ALCS without him. And he was so integral to that team that I, I want to see a healthy Garrett Whitlock this year. So if that means throwing him in the bullpen and having him not in the rotation, I'd prefer that. I understand why they're stretching him out, but I, I worry about the, the long-term health risks of continuing to have him be a starter. With Winkowski, I, I guess I'm still intrigued by what he can bring. And, and Alex Cora seems to believe that the velocity that he showcased in, in shorter outings could translate as a starting pitcher. I think because of... The, the 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 inconsistencies we saw from two years ago, I, I may just have that memory still lodged in my head. And again, I know I know Hauk has had his issues as a starting pitcher as well. So it's not like any of the three necessarily are are locks. But I think I'd still go with Hauk, maybe just because he's done it the most. But I'm I'm intrigued. If Alex Cora is intrigued, I'm intrigued. Yeah, I think that's fair, and I think it's a fair discussion to go and think about any of these guys because they all have shown that potential but they all have like that one wart. Like you you look at Winkowski and it's, he showed us a couple of years ago as a starter that it wasn't there, but obviously the velocity ticked up last year, but is that because the velocity ticked up or is that because he was throwing in shorter bursts? How it's like he's dominant, but then he gets touched up in the fourth or fifth inning at third time through because he doesn't have that third pitch down. Whitlock has, has shown that he can go deeper in games, but then it's, he gets hurt. He's bulked up. Is, is is that going to be enough to overcome that? Or is he just an injury-prone guy? Like, there's so much to find out. And, like, if they were just some schmucky nothing team without any money, I think a lot of people would be okay watching all of them start. But it's it's just because of the, the position they're in, the pockets they have, the fact that this year people just thought the uncertainty was over and now it's kind of still around that people are made – are so uncomfortable – with the idea of any of these guys getting that spot. But yeah, it's basically a matter of which which one of those warts do you think could be overcome the easiest? Because all those guys have it in them. Like we've seen them, like you said, they're all big league pitchers. I'd take it a step further. They're all really good big league pitchers. It's just a matter of if they can handle that role. Yeah, they're all good league pitch good big league pitchers. It's just are they in the wrong role? And I think you know, where I as we're having this conversation, I, I get a little frustrated is this has now been a multi-year discussion, right? We thought last year this would be figured out that, you know, through the course of the season, okay, this person, you know, whatever one you want to pick, okay, they should be in the bullpen. It it would have been decided after the totality of the 2023 season. And as we all thought that the team was going to go out and spend for a starting pitcher and that hasn't happened yet. They're lucky that they have Cutter Crawford. And I think he showcased himself to be a guy that, deserves a spot in the starting rotation. And it's a testament to the Red Sox that they've been able to develop this guy into a big league starter, considering he was the 16th round pick. That just doesn't happen. You know, guys that were drafted that late that can be starting pitchers in the big league. So I do think you have to give the Red Sox a lot of credit that they've developed somebody like him into a starting pitcher, where if you look at his baseball savant, you see a lot of red, which is awesome to see as a baseball nerd and also somebody that follows his team. Um, but those other couple guys, I, I just thought by now you'd kind of want to have that figured out. And even for a guy like Winkowski, like when, when they, the Red Sox got him and then what we saw what he did in 2022, and of course they, it was in a trade with Andrew Benintendi, everybody's lamenting that Benintendi is no longer on the team. He becomes an all-star the next year. And then we see what he does with the White Sox last year and you spend money on him. And maybe it's just because he's in that environment where – free agents or players seem to go to die unless you're Luis Robert or Dylan Cease. Um, you know, he's turned into the player that he is now, basically a replacement level player. And now you have Winkowski who's a, who's a really good pitcher, at least he was last year. But I just wish we had that figured out. And I guess we're going to find out again in 2024 because these guys, we'll, we'll see who gets a shot. Maybe it's a couple of them. But um, the fact that this is still a discussion, I think, is, is something that merits – I do think a little bit of frustration, but at the same time, at least you know that they're guys that can pitch in the big leagues. One follow-up thought on that is, and I'm going to sound like the biggest hypocrite in the world, but I feel like trying to make a guy like Winkowski, who was a lights-out reliever, 
back into the rotation. If he fails there, Garrett Whitlock hasn't been shut down as shut down as he was once he was kind of failed as a starter, put back in the bullpen. The definition of psych- being psychotic is doing the same thing over and over. Like, <laughs> you just change the name and you did the same thing. So there is, I agree, there's like a lot of, there should be frustration. Like, we've tried this before, it doesn't work. We have to try something else. But then they're like, oh, Whitlock couldn't do it. But I mean, what if Winkowski can do it, you know? But I did have a follow-up on something you said earlier, though. Sedan Rafaela, Cora has been raving about Sedan Rafaela, his outfield defense, how versatile he is, speed. He said the swing and miss needs to go down. We've talked about it a little bit here. I want your take here. Do you – actually, it's two parts. Do you think he should be on the opening day roster? And do you think he will be on the opening day roster due to service time manipulation? And I, I figured you were going to bring up that last that last thing there, Pat. And I just – I hate these discussions because it's, it's so against what we are as fans. Yeah. Like – Oh, you're probably good enough to be in the big leagues, but yeah, we're going to leave you down there to get an extra year of control. And I, I used to broadcast games in the White Sox system, and this was a whole thing with Aloy Jimenez and Luis Robert. It drove me crazy because I'm like, just I want to just see these guys in the major leagues. Um, I I think he will end up being on the opening day roster. Could be wrong, obviously, it's just a guess. But I think that that Alex Cora likes what he sees. I I do think despite him still swinging at a lot of pitches in the minors. You saw the numbers last year. I had a chance to see it a little bit filling in on some games for the Wu Sox. He, he dominated that level. I don't, I don't know how much it would help him to go back down. And then on top of that, I, this Red Sox team, despite now having Trevor story back is, is, is a player that you're going to have opening day. God, you know, knock on wood, nothing happens in spring training. Um, this team need this team needs defense, right? We, this is a team that needs good defensive players. You throw him out there in center field. We've heard what he can do. I've, I've seen it down there a little bit. It's he's a, he's a remarkable defender. And I think he's a guy that could grow into himself offensively. If you give him an opportunity at the big league level, now the playing time part of it's going to be interesting where they, they figure out where to play him and how they're going to mix in all the outfielders that they have. But I think he's a guy you want on your team based on all he can bring. I mean, I think he can affect the game in a lot of different ways. He's obviously so young. He had a short sample size last year, but I'm excited to watch him play. Like, I don't know what he's going to turn into, but I think it could be somebody that can have an impact for the Red Sox. Maybe not this year compared to years in the future, but I'd like to see what they have because you know, where we're at right now with the outlook of this team, I want to see, see guys that are, that are, big league players, which I think he is at this point, I want to see what they can do. Why not? So I understand the service time thing. What I would advise, I'm curious what you guys think. I just feel like from my vantage point doing the pre-post stuff, I don't like to be the one to be like, oh, leave him in the minors because you get an extra year of added control. I obviously understand the argument, and and I know that the worries about finances is, 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 is a worry that everybody in Red Sox Nation has right now. But – if you're, I just feel like if you're a fan, like you want to see this guy in the major leagues, right? Like, why do we need to wait a year and a half? Yes, or a month and a half. I understand you you get another year of control, but I I, I just want to see him play. I want to see him play at Fenway. Is that is that selfish of me? Maybe, but uh, but no, that's, no. That, that's that's what I want. Sammy, I think, give your take on this. Give your take yeah. on this. So I unfortunately I think they should keep him in AAA until I believe it's May 16th to get that extra year. <laughs> And that's not because I don't want to see him in the majors or anything like that. It's just that's the way they operate now. And I feel like it would be a big departure from everything we've seen over the last three, four years for them to suddenly stop caring about things like service time or keeping him the extra year, small things like that. And I know the counter argument to that would be if he finishes top three, I believe, in rookie of the year after starting in the majors, they get an extra, what, draft pick or something? They they get compensated. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. comp pick. Great. But like, that just seems like a very flimsy plan for a team that's operating as if they're a small market team playing pretend like a small market team. I think you have to continue that act until you're ready to completely change. And you got Jordan Montgomery begging to be signed by the Red Sox and they're not doing it. So I don't think they've changed. Therefore, I think you have to keep them down for a month and a half and then you reap the benefits. What five, six years from now, 
when you get an extra year of control. It sucks. I hate it. It doesn't feel like a fan desire, but if that's how they're going to operate, I don't feel like now is the time to stop operating in that way, if that makes sense. It does make sense. I'm curious, though. Do you want to see him on the opening day roster? Say that that didn't matter. Oh, oh, if it, if it didn't matter, of course, man. I, I love <laughs> Rafael. He's one of my favorite prospects in the system. I love those high floor guys like he he can hit at like a 40th percentile rate, like unimpressive, still be super valuable. So, of course, I'd love to see him as a fan on the opening day roster. I think that'd be great. It would be exciting for the fan base. But it's hard for me to to say that without also in the back of my mind thinking about the way that this franchise has operated in recent years. It's just, I, I don't know. I don't see them leaving that style of operation anytime soon. So so why with Rafaela? And and I understand that. It, I just, it, it, where, where our perspective is, I, I still, it, it it's hard for me to advocate for it, especially because you just never know what the future can hold. Also, you don't know, like, I wonder, say the Red Sox do need him early in the year, maybe for depth purposes. I mean, it, it, I just feel like if, if he's a guy that deserves to play, he should play. But I get it. I mean, and, and, I, and I think a lot of people are thinking that way now. It's, it is unfortunate that people like that, that, that these are thoughts that are in our head. Oh, if he gets another extra year, you know, or the Red Sox get an extra year of control, does it does allow him to keep him longer instead of just being able to sign him long term? But I'm I'm always going to be team advocate for them to play because you know I just always I always thought it was such a bummer when when this really the wave of any of this stuff started and I and I know it, it became a bigger issue for Major League Baseball with Chris Bryant in, in 2015 with the Cubs and and like that, that that they had to wait an extra time to get him to the big leagues and even though he was he was ready for it I'm just ready to see this dude play and like you speak to to some of the, the, the decisions that have been made in the off season with the Red Sox and the excitement level of this team. I think this is a guy that could be really exciting to watch. And I'd like to see it from day one, but I do understand that perspective. Pat, where are you at on this? Yeah, I'm kind of in the middle. Like, I think it's so contextual. Uh, choose a side. I know. I want him on the major league team. I do. I want him to be the starting center fielder. At the same time, do I understand why you send him back down from a – team construction management standpoint yes but because it's the, the red sox are not likely it won't be that good this year so getting that extra year control down the line will add up that being said if let's say the orioles don't start jackson holiday in the mlb this year that's where you're like all right this is ridiculous they, they just want a year of control because that's a guy that impacts a team in a way that they're already a playoff team they are in another echelon if jackson holiday is as good as people say he is in Sedan's case, he would make the Red Sox better. Up the middle defense would be incredible with Long, Story, Casas. Hopefully, Von Grissom is at least average in second base. But off the bat, it's just so hard to be like, yeah, it's definitely worth losing a year of this guy for what's more than likely going to be like a 500 team. But I'm with you, Joe. I completely 100% hope he is the starting major league center fielder on opening day. Can I pick the other end of this? Like, like big, big difference if it weren't a bridge year, Pat. That's a good point that I didn't touch yeah. on. I think that if it were a team that wasn't far and away the fifth best team in the division right now, then you'd be more open to saying, all right, screw it. We need this defense. Start them in the majors. But hard it's, for me to come around when it's a bridge year. And they're telling the you. Sedan's floor is what Alec Thomas is for the Diamondbacks. Like, even if he can't hit, that defense is so valuable. In yeah. the right spots, and that I mean, that's his floor. So yeah, like even a guy like that, if he can't hit his rookie year, it's he should be the opening day center fielder. He should be. I'm going to take the other end of this because if it's up to me, there's still multiple free agents out there that could give you guaranteed production. You could go either way with it. You could go with the Michael A. Taylor and prioritize the defense, throw Jaron Duran in left, or you could go with Adam Duvall, who I guess you could play left or center or you could get the hf bats or play first like you could go a bunch of different routes with this and like this is service time aside the way i look at this is you start new every season they have a chance every single season there's only been two seasons where i've ever counted them out on day one and that was 2013 and 2021 and we we know how both of those seasons went so the way i see it is try as hard as you can from day one there's a good chance that just like Jaron Duran last year, someone's going to go down and he'll find his way into the lineup. 
definitely before I would think before. Well, what Sammy? What's the date? Is it May sixteenth? May sixteenth, correct. May sixteenth. Like I think he'll find his way if he's in the minors. I think an injury will force him into the lineup before then, sort of like Duran last year, and then he has a chance to earn his job like that. But I don't know. It just feels like they're focused on building. Isn't that worst case scenario though? If he starts in the minors and then comes up before May sixteenth, because then you earn your job, man. You got to earn it. You don't get the rookie of the year kind of top three reward if he gets that either, because then you then you get no compensation either in terms of years or. I hate thinking like this. I really, really do. And this this is is why we operate. And this is why I was just saying from the 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 fan. Also, it's interesting. Gordo, you, you're bringing up Duran because, right, when he came up, it was from the get-go, he was productive, right? And now yep. I was just looking this up to make sure I had it right. It was it was in mid-April he came up. So they, they had a need for him at that point because you just never know from an injury standpoint how it goes. Like, how like it, worst case scenario, how long do you wait to bring him in if if the injuries pile up in the outfield? And you can't you can't look at it like that from a team building but, perspective. It's just but but say it but say it happens you know say it happens anyway. Like in the, the Duran story was one of my favorites from last year too because I feel people were down on him for good reason right after 2022 and then I, I even though he had a chance to to be a part of the World Baseball Classic I think people wanted him to be in spring training with the Red Sox and then he was at many at several different points one of the most exciting players that they had. And I think one of the better stories of, of last year. So um, I hate to see you guys so down, but I, I, underst- I understand it. I totally understand it. It's an interesting argument with them. I actually was curious from your guys' perspective, the, the beginning of the season slate for the Red Sox. Have you guys really taken a look at like the, the April calendar? Yeah. Because they I start I'm, all on the West, right? It's, it's like nine on the West Coast. So 10? they start they start on the West Coast, right? So they play they play four. It's ten on the West Coast. It's they get four against the Mariners, so I think we expect to be a solid team, especially on the pitching side. Then they got the A's, Angels. Then they come home. They play the Orioles, who are, are expected to be good. Angels again, Guardians, Pirates, Guardians, Cubs. I mean, would it be that crazy if they started off pretty well this year? That's not bad. And then you get the West Coast trip. Out of the way. Don't do this to me, man. You're talking me into this team. <laughs> I'm already Listen, doing well, but you like, guys, you it, guys it, talking it, about control and and and, and worrying about that, which I, I do understand. But I'm trying to get inject some positivity in here because I was looking at this today, and I, I, I just looking at the teams that they start off against. Not exactly world beaters. Obviously, they start off with the Orioles at home, but not 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 that tough a schedule to begin the season. The Mariners is kind of tough. That's Mariners like, could be tough. Yeah. Oh, if you, they could make your bats ice cold right off yeah. the bat. But, but hey, Angels, like, Angels and A's, you no, know, you, you've got me. You've got me there. Because what is it? Where's the four game series? Is the four gamer in? Uh, it's in Oakland? Seattle. Yeah. So it starts in Seattle to start okay. out the year. So then you yeah. got six, six against Oakland and LA. You, you take two in Seattle and you should get at least four of the six. And then you start the season six and four. See, there's a smile. I see one smile there. That's what and I like. there you go. You go from there. I, I listen. I will always believe that they have a chance to compete in any given year until, until they show me they're out of it. Like last year, I was all in on it until, I think after that Blue Jays series in August. Like everyone else was trying to get the trying to force the sell, and I was all in on the buy. Yeah. I just, I didn't want them to sell. I I they were a couple games out. We see teams like that compete all the time and go to the World Series. You saw it with the Braves. You saw it with the Nats. Like. It's baseball, man. This it's it's 162 games, and anything can happen in any given year. And I feel like no fan base should know that more than this. And especially right. at the beginning of the season, like optimism is bound. I, I I understand the pessimism right now, but to your point, I like last year I I was still in on the team, and I especially remember there was a series, a two gamer against the Braves, where they came back against Spencer Strider. It, you know, Costas had a good game. I think it was Justin Turner had a go ahead two run double. And and they won that game. And I remember I did post game afterwards, and I was like, this team should buy. And then obviously they did, and, and the wheels fell off in the end. But yeah, I I I I wonder now the flip side to that opening stretch conversation is say they go three and seven on that road trip, people would, mm-hmm. might might be might be out from the get go because twenty nineteen, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the nineteen. Yeah. That's that's what I was gonna say. Twenty nineteen was like twenty eleven, right? The highest of highs. 
you were the oh, best 11 team. stunk too. Right. Yeah. Like, I remember 2011, they got off to a really slow start and they, and they obviously had that high payroll. So everyone's like, what is this team? It was the beginning and end of that season. That was just yeah. dreadful. But like, think about the, the difference between 11 and 19 versus this year. Like you can get off to a cold start in those years. And like the preseason hope of those years can kind of keep you afloat. Cause you look at the roster and you convince yourself like, there's no way this team can actually be bad. Like they just won a gazillion games in 2018. There's no way that the 19 team, all, all they lost was Kimbrell. There's no way they're going to be bad. And, but you look at this year, if they, if they go three and seven on those first 10, and now you've got like Oakland and LA and the angels out of the way. There's going to be a oh my god that would be bad that would be really bad. And there's I, nothing I, to keep you afloat if they do that. And I and I think part of it and I'm sure you guys feel this way is is you you talk about those two seasons 2011 2019 those rosters had the core guys that were a part of the championship teams right so 2011 you you still had Pedroia you had Beckett you had Papelbon you had Ortiz and then in in Euclid, and then. In 2000, in 2019, obviously, you had so many of the guys from the 2018 team still left over. Whereas now we're in 2023, and, and you just have Rafi, right? And as great a player as Rafi is in that 2018 team, he wasn't the top dog at that point. You know, he was still still so young, and I and it really kind of hit his stride the next year. So it's a different feel, and they they just don't have that star power that'll that'll carry the optimism. I think if they get off to a slow start, which that that beginning stretch I, I, it would be key to set the tone to, hey, this could be a season where we exceed expectations. But uh, then the flip side of that is, is again, if they start off slow, then, then maybe people are out from the get-go. So speaking of optimism, Kenley Jansen. <laughs> I can tell exactly segue. where you're going with that. <laughs> That's a great segue. That's it. Just Kenley Jansen. No, um, so I, I I personally want them, the Red Sox, to trade Kenley, not because I don't like him, but after his slew of interviews with the Boston media, it's pretty clear that they, the Red Sox, lied to him about their intention to contend. Uh, and whether you agree with that or not, it seems like Kenley Jansen is pretty unhappy. So I'd like to see him in his uh, last few years of his career get a chance to close out the World Series because that's his dream. He's talked about that before. I want to get a temperature check from you. Where are you at on the whole Kenley Jansen situation? I completely understand his frustration with, with the situation at hand because I, he'd had no reason to lie on the record. I've listened to a lot of his interviews he's done with Brad Foe, and, and especially what you just alluded to, Sammy, about wanting to be the, the guy in the mound to close out the World Series because he didn't have a chance to do it with the Dodgers in 2020. I think that that's that's the direction I, that they're going to have to go in if they're not playing well, because why keep him? And also, I do think from an organizational standpoint, it would be smart to do right by a player like Kenley Jansen, a veteran who's, you know, he's got a Hall of Fame case, I think, already right now to to, to ultimately deal him if you're not in a position to contend. It, it's sad because I, I do think he he embraced being here and. And he just kind of got it. I, I always got the sense that he just got what it would what it meant to be a Boston Red Sox and 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 pitch in, in the Northeast, which you consider his career and, and LA is just a whole different a whole different feel to it. I'd say in Atlanta and in a different way too, than the Northeast baseball. Like we're we're intense about baseball up here in a way that is just not normal to other markets. And I thought he embraced that and and was vocal about this team needing to add last year, and then they didn't. And, and to this point, it's the players have been extremely honest in, in spring training about the direction that this team is now going in. That I think we're all taken aback by the honesty because I think to I think about Bull Durham, right? You, I don't know if you guys have seen that. I'm, I'm oh, sure yeah. you have. Oh yeah, 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 oh, yeah. yeah all timer. But you just think of the, the 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 cliches that Crash is teaching Nuke, you know, to say to the media. And, and I think baseball players a lot of times kind of fall into that, which is great. This is why Brad Foe's podcast is great and what you guys have been doing with, with your interviews as well with, with getting a chance to talk to some of these guys. But I, I was, I've was i been struck by the honesty from the players about where this team currently sits. Like Rafi being as honest as he is what really stood out to me, you know, just saying everybody here knows what we need. Um, and, and Kenley's been the same way. I mean, I respect his professionalism 
that he's saying, you know what, I, this is, this is different than I thought, but, and I'm paraphrasing, but you know, different than I thought, but I'm still going to go out there and compete. But I don't see how this is going to make its way through the season unless they're, unless they, unless they surprise everybody and, and they're like sitting, you know, atop the division toward the end of the season, past the trading deadline that, that he'll stay on this team just because you want to do right by somebody like that. And, and, and if the direction, and I think you do that if, if the direction that you pitched him is different and I know it's a different regime, but I just, I, it's hard for me to see him being on this team through the end of 2024. If, if, if they don't add Jordan Montgomery, they don't add anybody else. And then they play to the, the expected record that every projection has them at. All right, Joe, I got a follow up for you. I'm ready. I'm putting you on the hot seat. Okay. Ooh. So this is just going off of last year's bullpen and just kind of getting a feel for how core talks about these guys. I would say right now, these guys are locks for the bullpen. Kenley, Chris Martin, Winkowski, Whitlock, Bernardino, Kelly. I'm going to make you choose three of this list who you think will make the roster. Slayton, Weissert, Murphy, Campbell, Criswell. So you have to cut two. Well, that's tough. I I think I'm contractually obligated to say Chris Murphy because I know you you're bo- your boys with him. Hell yeah, our friend. All right, that was the correct answer. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care who the other one is. Okay. No, I, I saw. Chris I read. Because uh, to me, I read Catillo's uh, Ross. He made a roster projection today, and I li- I literally scrolled right to the bullpen to make sure he had Murphy, and he didn't. Yeah, piece of we shit. Gotta, yeah, we gotta we gotta we gotta, <laughs> we, gotta, we, gotta we gotta go teach. Chris Cotillo a lesson. Well, yeah, he's getting surgery on his leg soon, so uh, yeah, we're going. We'll take advantage while he's while he can. We walk. wish, yeah, we wish Chris the best. I appreciate it. he joined us for a uh, Christmas a Christmas weekend show. It was a, for like a Friday night. And he just came in, and I appreciated that. I, I think Weissert's going to be another guy that that's in there. Um, God, this is tough. So so my other options were it was so Campbell, you... Slayton. So I'm going. I'm going Murphy. Yes, because to me, I, I would be curious to, before we get to the second one. To me, you have to have two lefties in the bullpen. Yeah, I like I like the argument, and I think he was pretty good out of the bullpen last year. Like, I know he had you know a couple outings where it didn't go his way, but I overall liked what he did in the bullpen for them. I, I and to have him back next year to kind of build off that, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely on board. So now you have well, to pick your boy. I, I can't, again, I can't, I can't, it's contractually obligated. Hold so on, hold on. One. He he went. He said Weiser. He he. You you like Weiser? Do you dock points from him because he let up a hit to Marty Mush? Yeah, <laughs> I do. I dock. I dock points. You can't be letting up hits to Marty Mush. So it can't be. It can't happen. So Weiser. So you have Murphy Weiser. You have to pick one of Slayton, Campbell, Chriswell, and then we'll throw in Joe Jakes. Yeah, that's tough. Um. Slayton has to be on the opening day roster to get control. It's true. To maintain gotta, control, I should say. You gotta wave him if he's not. Yeah, I maybe I'd go with Slayton, but it's it's close. It's close. I, I, you know, I with all those guys, I'm kind of like I, I, I want to see what they bring to the table. With the, yeah. whereas, you know, with Weiser, we've we, we've seen him at least with you know, we, with the Yankees. I've you know, you see that the frisbee slider he has. I'm I'm very intrigued by that, and I I've been. I mean, I'm excited about the pitching. I, I, yeah. Like, what 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 Craig Breslow is going to do with this group? I'm 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 willing to buy in optimistically until proven otherwise with yep. with Breslow on pitchers because of where he comes from, and you think of the Cubs and the way he was able to develop that program and and actually get guys that were homegrown guys that ended up producing with 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 the big league club that even Theo struggled with. As good as great a GM as he is, so I guess I go Slayton. I, I I wish I was particularly, I had a strong opinion on any of them, but again I, I gotta go. I'm going Murph because I, I he's your guy and I liked watching him last year. I, I thought he 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 was pretty good for the Red Sox last year. And then and then Weiser, I'm just intrigued by what he what he's gonna bring to the yeah. table. And I like the Verdugo trade. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting sure. because Pat, you bring up all those names and you ask who has the leg up, and I know we're still early in the spring. But every single one of these guys with options that Breslow has brought in, based off of the reports we've seen, what we've seen from them in their outings this spring, like they've all looked good. 
Like, it seems like he's on track to hit on at least a few of these guys, and that's something they didn't have last year. So, like, we talk a lot about about what they've lost. You know, they're losing Justin Turner, losing Chris Sale and James Paxton, but, like, something that they desperately needed last year was bullpen depth. Hein Bloom talked about it. He wanted guys that could go up and down, be able to keep arms fresh that way, have guys you could trust both on the major league roster, but also on the triple A roster that you can call up whenever they're needed. They didn't have that last year, even though they said it was a priority. It just, they didn't have it. The guys they were calling up and down, it like, Oh my God, who were some of these guys that they, that they had last year? Who's that? They, Caleb they, Ort. Or who was the guy they got from the angels with the mustache? Like, Weiss. Weiss. Zach Weiss. Not Weiss. No, not Weiss. Weiss. He also came from the angels. You're right. They, this Sammy, we were at a game. Scott? Zach Scott? No. Taylor? Oh, ta- you're thinking of Taylor Scott. Scott. That's not home. Taylor Scott. Yeah. This this guy. Uh... Zach Scott's the actor. <laughs> Who's the guy that pitched against? Yeah. The- okay. I said that. I was like, wait a minute. Who is the guy? Uh, he's he's his name is totally is it Garcia? lost. Me. Yeah, Sign Garcia. There was there was one guy that Garza. Pitched against- Garza. Oh, Garza. 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 Yeah. Yes. No. No more Justin Garza's on this team. It looks like. There you go. Yeah. Joe, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say, who's the guy that pitched against the Cubs and he, he like really struggled to throw a strike? Oh, I, oh, oh my God! And then he, Mauricio Yovera too. He was the starter oh, on the Rays. God. The Statcast darling, Mauricio Yovera. He was a starter on the Rays. You said Gordo. This guy was a starter on the Rays years ago, and he showed some promise. And he made like two outings for the Red Sox last year. I know exactly who he's talking oh. about. He let in like a gazillion runs against the Cubs. Um. Yeah, oh, you talking about um, he wore number thirty-two. Denelson Lamette? No, but no more Denelson no, Lamette. No, <laughs> I'll try to figure it out. All right. Well, well, the one name out. that I left off of that list, which is worth noting, as Gorda brought up options, I did not list Brian Montebert, who is out of options, I believe, and out of a elbow or shoulder or whatever. Yeah, he hurt. that's the guy who's hurt right now. He is not going to make the roster which is crazy considering where he stood in the farm system three four years ago Discipline. yeah he was he, he was one of their top guys and and i remember when i was calling games in the carolina league he was he actually pitched in 2019 with uh the salem red sox and, and this is just like a it, it's it's one of those tales of how not every guy is going to work out even if they're highly touted but i remember back then he was like this guy could be a be a huge asset for the Red Sox, and it's like, okay, when is he going to make his way up? And yeah, injuries have caught up to him for sure. And I know there there might be other things as well, but yeah, I I I I like their bullpen if they're bring, especially because Jansen's still there and Martin was incredible last year. I mean, what a what a signing he was. He was so much fun to watch too because he it just seemed like clockwork every time he we went out there. But those guys you mentioned, we could probably do without Jake, Jake Ferreira. Ferreira. Yeah, there you yeah, go. There, there, you go. There, there it is. The guy who yeah. hurt Sander, right? He's the guy who hit Bogarts in the wrist, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah you're right. Yeah. Mother. Okay. All right. <laughs> Jordan Montgomery is a pitcher. Good pitcher. He's unemployed. Some would say he's a good unemployed pitcher. I think the Red Sox are going to sign him. I will say my confidence has dwindled a little bit, but I'm not. Moving off of my take. You're not allowed. Joe, are the Red Sox going to sign Jordan Montgomery? Sure. Oh, <laughs> right. heard it here first. That's all we need. You heard it here first, folks. Sure. It did, it, it did pique my interest a little bit when the, after the Cubs signed Bellinger and Scott Boris was on, on the dais there and they were they were talking about possible, you know, either a future. They were yucking it up. They were yucking it up. I it Gross. just it's it just seems like such a perfect fit. I know it's we've been saying this all off season long, but the fact that he lives here, the fact that the Red Sox need a starter, and maybe his price is coming down a little bit. I I think the only thing that does concern me is with the, like a Bellinger signing, right? The the opt out thing and and the the going for the more money per year type deal with opt-outs rather than a longer term deal. I do think that works against the Red Sox because they just don't seem privy to, to pushing close to the luxury tax right now. 
So I think the longer term deal makes more sense because you're spreading it out over years and you're not putting yourself as close. I hope it happens, guys. I mean, it it, it, it makes too much sense. He's not, he's not, you know, pitching Jesus or whatever religion you believe in. Um, but he's somebody that would help out this team, obviously, so much. He's such a consistent guy from an inning standpoint, ERA standpoint, doesn't allow a lot of home runs. And I think he'd be a perfect fit to to supplement this this rotation that has promise with younger guys. But it'd be nice to have some certainty in that rotation because there's not a lot of it. I think Bayo's going to be good. He's got to figure out how to pitch against left-handed hitters a little bit better. But I, I, I just think if you sign him, at least you're giving fans – a little bit more certainty in the rotation. And, and, and now you're, you're, you can start talking yourselves into pushing for a wild card spot. So I'm going to say yes. Okay. But I'm not that optimistic. And I'd like, I'd like to, it to be figured out. I hate that. The, I do hate that this is getting dragged out. Like, like with all these free agent pitchers and I would love for baseball to figure something out, but I just don't know what that is because the deadline thing, I, to me, that you're, you're, you might be suppressing player salaries, which I don't think is good for the game because you're forcing teams to act quicker and then for them to settle for certain things. But this dragging out stuff, it, 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 I think it's bad for the game. Start it later. Start, I wanted to start on like January first, and it, it, like at least that just condenses things. Yeah, like, that may, that and Sammy, that might be the answer. Like I, I wish I could come up with a good answer for it because. Yeah, I just think to have a, a, a reigning Cy Young Award winner, to have Jordan Montgomery still out there, Bellinger out there, although I do understand, like, I thought the projections for him were pretty crazy. Like, seeing somewhere that it was like he was going to get a 12 year deal, that, yeah, like, are you kidding me? Like, did, I, I think he's a good player, but he was terrible for two straight seasons before last year. So, yeah, I don't you know. Mentioned, you mentioned reigning Cy Young Award winner. I completely forgot about Snell until you just said that. He's now. still out there. It's, we covered we covered this sport, and I the reigning Cy Young Award winner is just chilling, probably getting ready for whoever he's going to play for. It's not good for the game, man. Every other sport has that big flurry of moves in the off season, and they kind of quote unquote steal a week of whatever other season is going on. Like, I mean, basketball is by far the best at this. Basketball dominates uh, like in the middle of the summer for a week, which is crazy, but. They're great at marketing their game. So and I agree. One of yeah. the big, yeah, yeah, we're going to get that soon. But I think one of the big reasons why this happens, it's that draft pick comp, which is why I'm so surprised that Monty's still out there. Because to your point, Joe, like you brought it up, you said, I don't think that short term deal, high AAV structure kind of works for the Red Sox in this case. I don't think it works for Monty either. Because yeah. this is a guy who got traded in the middle of the season. He doesn't have that draft pick comp attached to him. That's why I'm so surprised he's still out there. But if he took one of those deals, if he took the Bellinger deal with the hopes of opting out after year one, now he's going to opt out after year one. He's going to be a, a year older. And now if he doesn't get traded, he's going to have that draft pick comp attached to him. It's going to be even harder to find a deal. So, yeah, I'm shocked he's still out there just because, I mean, there's there's really not much creativity to be had. It's who can offer the most years, who can offer the most money. The only reason I can think of is there's just not anywhere close to the amount of interest they'd hoped. It's expensive and to have baseball players, Gordo. A wise man did did say that at one point, Sammy. <laughs> I'd argue the wise man thing, but <laughs> <laughs> I and, and I I think the other question too is is what 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 holes like what what are you nitpicking with Montgomery? Um, because. Like, unlike Snell, it's not up and down, up and down. It's, it's, you, you know, you kind of know what you're getting. And yes, it's not top 10 pitcher in baseball, but it's at least over this three year stretch, starting pitcher wise, it's top 20. And that's, that's, that's pretty bankable. And right. you know, he can pitch in the American League East. He's won a World Series now. He's been good in the playoffs too. He's not just a bandwagoner. Like, he, he was awesome for the, the Rangers and he, and, he pitched well. I remember with the Yankees in 2020, he, he like he, I think he pitched game four against the Rays and they needed a win. And he actually pitched pretty well, too. So, I mean, it was front of no fans. It was in that crazy COVID season. But still, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I wish I hope he get, just gets signed because like I need closure at this point. I've heard Lou say this and I and I'm I'm on board a good point. Like 
I just need closure. Like, can we just move forward? End yeah. End it. Let's fix like like hopefully it happens soon. They they decide on where he get, you know, he decides on where he's gonna sign, gets the deal he wants, and we could all move on. But hopefully it's for the Red Sox because it would make this season a lot better. And on top of the nice things you said about Montgomery, I will also add that that's the type of profile of a pitcher that will age gracefully. He's not going out there pumping 99 yeah, absolutely. max effort kind of guy. He's he's a finesse guy. Like he doesn't, he's not throwing pus out there, but he's not, you know, blowing his elbow out, knock on wood. So I just don't get it. I don't get the hesitancy. Uh, it's, I don't know. I'm just kind of at a loss with it. I'm, I'm going to stick with my take. I'm glad you're with me. And, uh, I'm glad you're sticking with it, Sammy, because I'm not going to let you. I'm not letting you not stick with it. Like you're on. Normally, it. like if you make a take and it turns out bad and you back off of it, I respect it. But this one, I'm there's still like a part of my brain that's telling me it's not that crazy. Like John Henry might crack, and I think it's at this point. I'm saying John Henry. I'm not saying Red Sox ownership. I'm saying John Henry specifically will crack, and then maybe they sign Montgomery. I'm sticking with it. Joe's on my side now, so that's uh, two of us on this island. Sammy will be held accountable for two things throughout this season. Or I guess one of them, Montgomery, until he signs. The other one, which we've talked about on the show before, oh, God. at winter weekend, Sammy said, well, you know, if Giolito goes back to how he was and everything falls the right way, Red Sox, they might be really good. And story. And being- story. I said Giolito in story. Yes. Those well, that two. actually that's actually a good segue because that was going to be – we're going to let you get out of here in a sec, but this that, that was my final question. For the Red Sox to make the postseason this year, and you can name as many things as you want depending on how far away you think this team is from being in the postseason, what needs to break right for the Red Sox to make the postseason in 2024? I think the Giolito thing will be helpful, and – I, I, I'm already two, a two for two with like agreeing with Sammy. So we're, we're thinking along the same, same wavelength on a couple different things, but I, I like the signing when it happened um, because I, I, at least I, with him, there, there's a background of him being pretty good for a couple of years. And, and I think, and I think based on what, what we've learned afterwards, like he's not going to give up as many home runs as he did last year. And obviously that doesn't mean he's going to be a good pitcher again, but I, I do think that he, he the trade getting traded Seemed like he was going through some stuff off the field as well. I, I think this sometimes happens where you have a, you have a year like that, but then you find yourself in the right situation, pitching infrastructure now with the Red Sox. I I, I am on board with that. I, I'm I'm optimistic about it, but I do think like Gordo, I do think a lot has to happen to go right. So you talk about like what needs to break right. Trevor Story needs to 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 not get hurt this year. I think at 140 games plus. Uh, Casas needs to take a step in year two, 30 home runs or more. Hopefully we, we get that out of Tristan Casas. Uh, Rafi Devers needs to play a competent third base, which I, I love Rafi. I'm skeptical of, of that happening based on what we've seen now for, for a large sample size of him at third base. They need, they need Cutter Crawford to be consistent. They need Kenley Jansen and, and Chris Martin to do what they did last year. They need more back-end help on the starting rotation. It's a long list of what-ifs, but a couple of things. A couple of things, yeah. but. A, lot, a but, lot of it needs to happen. A lot of it needs to happen. But I, 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 I just think from a starting pitching standpoint, they need more stability. That's the what-if. Can Giolito go back to the guy he was in, in 2021, or at least the first half of 2023? Can can Brian Bayo take another step forward? Because pitching has held this team back. I think offensively, they they could be better. Like these last couple of years, they could be better, especially from a power standpoint. But for a majority of last year, they were top 10 in average on base and slugging percentage. Doubles, they've been leading the, you know, they led the league in it. Again, home runs, they were down. That's that's a part of their offensive profile that I think could be better. But to me, pitching has just been the difference. Like 2022, horrendous bullpen, right? They fixed that in 2023. Then in the starting pitching side, they were they were bad. They were bottom three in innings, ERA, all that stuff. And it was an issue for them all season long. So I stick with the pitching. If they can figure that out, they, they have a chance to, to, to at least compete for a playoff spot this upcoming year. But they need guys to take steps forward. And, and I'm optimistic about Trevor Story's future, but this is it, right? Like he's had two down years. You can't, you've already, that's two, two of the six years he signed for. 
it has to start to improve. And I, I think it can, but time's starting to run out on that. And 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 if it doesn't, then that's going to go down as as one of the 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 worst contracts in recent years that the Red Sox have signed. As good as he is defensively, because of the implications, and you lost Sander and all that stuff, he needs a bounce back year. And and I'm excited to see it because I I, I think back to May 2022 when he was hitting home runs, and it seemed like momentum changing home runs, and at least last year playing some good defense. There are elements there, but he's got to put it together. And I think he's really the X factor for them on the offensive side. But of course, in the pitching, it all comes back to starting. And if and if they can they can cobble together a solid rotation, this team's got a chance to compete for a spot. God, and all I mean, all of these things, so many of them need to happen. And there's so many storylines going into the air. I mean, that's why we do what we do. That's why you do what you do. That's why we're having you on here. Joe Weil. I want to thank you for coming on with us, man. Joe Wild does the pre and post on WEI for Sox games. You excited to get going this year, man? Oh, uh, by the oh, time oh people God. are listening to this, by the time people listen to this show, opening day is this month. If you're listening, it's this Ooh. month. Just as I as I said before, just think about that opening stretch. Could be a chance for them to start off well, but don't come at me if they don't. That's all I ask. <laughs> but you can call it. All right, man. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, boys. Thanks, Joe. Big thanks to Joe Wild for jumping on, making his play testy debut. Uh, we'll be seeing a lot of each other this year. He does the pre and post on WEI or with WEI. A lot of crossovers happening. Like, we'll we'll be seeing a lot of Joe. You'll be seeing a lot of Joe. We'll be seeing a lot of each other. Uh, Sammy, Pat, we're we're going to jump, I guess, into some enough said. But I think before we get into the enough said, because this isn't my enough said. I said last episode what my enough said is going to be. Uh, but before we get into the enough said, big shout out to Will Fleming for shouting yeah. out the program. Yeah. On the Red Sox broadcast today, when Alex Benellis came up to the plate, he talked a, a little bit about our interview about his answer uh, with Sedan Rafaela, talk, talking about him as the guy he thinks is going to be a stud at the big league level. That was super cool. Uh, big thanks to our boy Zach for clipping that too. That was that was awesome to hear. Like, just really cool. You know, we're we have we've had this podcast. We've done a lot of episodes, but we haven't had this podcast since they played games. So, like, we're still new. And it's it's really cool for us to be hearing things like that. So a lot of appreciation there. Yes, yes. Second. I mean, that was just kind of I had to replay it a few times just to kind of know it was real. It's just weird hearing Will Fleming, a voice that I've heard so many times listening to games, and like he mentions our show. It was it was great. Uh, we really appreciate it. We work our butts off on this show, so it's nice to nice to get recognized and also, agree with uh, Alex Manellis, Sedan Rafaela. Keep an eye out. We Why talk a Rafael lot about Sedan on this show. So we'll see. I know. I was in between patients today and I saw like the Will Fleming mentioned us, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't know what the context was. I thought it was on Twitter. And I looked at my mentions and I was like, did he do this show on the broadcast? Yeah. And I was, like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, that was pretty sick. Yeah. Shout out Will Fleming. That was, that was awesome. So we're going we're gonna to jump into some Nuff Said, though. Any of you guys want to go first? Sammy, you want to go first on your enough said? Let's hear it. Sure. sure. Um, so I found out today, in case you didn't already know, the New York Yankees are frauds because, and I found no. this out uh, just through my research. So here's the story. New Era posted this new line of very ugly like hats and jerseys. Oh, yeah. I saw that. Where they all have pinstripes. And so I'm kind of like, there's a lull at work. I work from home. So I'm kind of just like, all right. I want to try to find a way to make fun of the Yankees with this tweet because pinstripes. And then I looked it up. The Yankees aren't even the first team in Major League Baseball to have pinstripes. Do you guys know who actually was first? It has to be the Cubs. Is it the, the Cubs? Cubs. The Cubs. Wow. So the Yankees, the Yankees with their earn your pinstripes, bro. You brought one. It's not even their thing. So yeah, just wanted to share with you guys that the Yankees are frauds. And uh, I hate them. Remember when they uh, saved a number for a year to try to get Yoshinobu Yamamoto? (laughs) (laughs) I I remember I tweeted that. I tweeted like, oh, my God, they saved his number, completely mocking it. And then I get like 20-something, what's it called, where you save the tweet? Oh, bookmarks. They bookmark the tweet. All these dorks like – uh, when he signs with the Yankees, I'm gonna let that Hebe Hammer really have it with my thoughts. 
<laughs> I should go back and check. <laughs> He's going to ruin the day He's when he hears ruin. my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> rule the day that he made fun of the Bronx Bombers and he will never earn his pinstripes. But yeah, one of the dorkiest mm. things ever. That's saving number 18 for him. And uh, anyway, to put a bow on it, yeah, Yankees are dorky and also frauds. The Cubs own the pinstripes. Pat, you got enough said for us? Yeah, I do. It, it, this one might be a hot take. This might have, like be cause divide between the listeners. Kike Hernandez is a loser. <laughs> He's such a loser, dude. He went on that idiot Przinsky's podcast today. I and like he that was show. claiming collusion in the MLB. Buddy, if there was any collusion, you think <laughs> Snell, Montgomery, and Chapman would be on teams right now? Also, not even Pat, that. He just signed ahead, today. He's like, oh, I just signed now because I, I don't want to say it, but there was collusion. Buddy, you batted 230 with a negative war. I don't think it was collusion that made you sign right now. Dude, he got $4 million. He yeah, should have signed he, there are better players that are signing minor league deals, and he's the one compl- – like, hold on. I, I actually kind of I, – I think I could buy into what he's saying with the collusion thing because, I mean, holy crap. Like, how is how is no team giving these guys their value? But Kike Hernandez being the one to say it after he gets $4 million after right. having, like, one of the worst – he might have had the worst season in baseball last year. Yo, he was statistically the worst player in major league <laughs> baseball last year, and he got $4 million. Don't talk to me about collusion. Randall Gritchick had an OPS over a thousand against lefties. I'm pretty sure, and he signed for like one and a half million. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. This, yeah, he's such a loser now. He's like, whoa. When did, he sign? When did Randall Gritchick sign? He signed the Diamondback. Oh right, right. You know why he took so long to sign? Because he sp- he spells Randall with one L, and it's very uncomfortable to look at. Huh. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. yeah that, that's my thought. Kike's a giant fucking loser. We got. We got dorks and losers enough said. We're just ripping everyone. Gordo, who are you going to rip apart? I'm not going to rip any. So I, I I teased it on the last show during enough said when we were talking about you sitting next to the, to the bathroom on our flight home from Fort Myers uh, at the end of March. Yep. And I said I had a good airplane bathroom story. And I do. Oh, so this is last April. My buddy was getting married. He's getting married in Texas. So we're flying – over to Texas, over to Houston for the wedding. And we're, we booked the flight where we don't get to pick our seats. So we go up to the front desk to, to get our seat assignments. And they tell us, oh, like, we screwed up. Like, so you guys are sitting first class. We're like, oh, my God, let's go. We're sitting in the first row. We got extra leg room. Like, this is great. It is the seats right next to the airport bath or to the plane bathroom. So we're sitting right next to the bathroom. <laughs> My buddy is getting ready to go to the bathroom. This this elderly woman walks out of the bathroom and oh my god, it reeks. It was it was so so bad. It was like the worst smell ever. And like we're just we're just stewing in it because we're sitting right next to the bathroom. My buddy, my buddy comes out of the bathroom. I double check it wasn't him. He's like, no, 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 no. It smelled like that when I got in there. It was the old lady that walked out. And I I jokingly said to him, I, I was like, you know, how funny would that be if if like she was like our buddy's grandma and she was going to this wedding and later that night there was like a welcome event and we get there and golly gee there she is man she's standing right there just like yucking it up with her grandson i'm like oh oh my god like do i have a story to tell you gassy grandma yeah gassy grandma man she she made that flight her own i will say did you tell him were you like hey i saw your grandma paint the dish on the flight Big time, yeah. I couldn't hold it in. I was crying. I was crying. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that has so many good phrases. Paint the dish. <laughs> Jackson, <laughs> Jackson pollocked the friggin' airplane toilet. Oh, gross. We've just lost all of our viewers with that one. But if you're still sticking around, you're a real one. Yeah. Oh, also, this isn't my enough said. Quick impromptu question for you, Gordo. Mm. You took some of my uh, very smart advice and you got yourself a few kiwis. Oh, I got like a whole, I got a whole thing of these things. I got like dozens of these things. 
How's your Kiwi experience been? Oh my God, it's so good, dude. Marissa looks at me like I'm absolutely insane when I'm just like taking giant bites out of these things. Like she's like sending like videos to people who are like, this guy's out of his mind. Like they don't, what the hell is he doing? This can't be healthy. It's like, no, oh, I, it's healthy. Fine. I had one before the show. Out. Yeah, when we're in Florida, we'll get a lot of Kiwis for the uh, the Airbnb, the Kiwi party. We'll get Rob on the Kiwi. Maybe we'll make the Red Sox a Kiwi eating team and everybody in the dugout is going to be ripping Kiwis with the skin on because that's that's badass. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. We we are a, we are a pro kiwi podcast. That is for sure. Nice Take a pack. bite out of those things. Eat the skin. Eat the skin if you haven't done it. It adds a nice little crunch to it. Yeah, I will say Gordo sent us a video, a video proof of him eating the kiwi. It was a bit long. That video was yeah. long. I was like, when is this going to end? He's going to eat this entire thing on video, but Nonetheless, I appreciate you providing evidence. And like I said, Pat, you're next. Coop, uh, I hope you also get on the Kiwi train. And soon, New England will be full of Kiwis. Yep. And you know what? I bet the Kiwi in Florida, and I've, I have no basis for this other than the fact that it's warm, but I bet the Kiwi down there is good. Isn't it a winter fruit? Oh, God. I didn't know that was such a thing. Is it? Well, I might be... Well, I don't know, dude. I know nothing about it. Like, come on. My head is just full of useless baseball okay. stuff. Let's just say it's a winter fruit. And if we're spreading misinformation on the internet, it is what it is. We love Kiwis. Yep, we do love Kiwis. And uh, we're, we're going to sign us off here. But before we do that, I do want to just take a second. I want to express our sincere sympathies for the Wakefield family. Uh, Stacy Wakefield, Tim Wakefield's wife, passed away. Uh, if you're listening on Drop it, it's just the other day. And just honestly so heartbreaking uh to lose both of them in a five month span i i just can't even like imagine you know what their what their kids are going through and i know the red Sox are are gonna be there for that family they're they're great about things like this and i i know that they've got the wakefields but like we just want to like as a podcast express our sincere sympathies to that family it's just unthinkable what they've gone through yeah well said uh thank you for taking that on i know it's not an easy thing to yeah. uh talk about gordo but uh yeah hug your loved ones life is short uh all the best to the wakefield family we're we're heartbroken along with you so stay strong yep and uh so that'll do it for us uh signing off for episode 46 uh big thanks to joe weil for jumping on with us we hope to do a lot with him this year he's doing the pre and post on wei uh, we'll hopefully be seeing a lot of him. He'll be seeing a lot of us. But before you sign off, make sure hit that subscribe button, uh, hit that follow button. Whether you're listening Odyssey app, Apple, Spotify, click that follow button, hit that subscribe button, rate us five stars, and leave a comment. And if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit that thumbs up, subscribe to the WEI channel. We've got our own playlist. Always forget that word. Uh, but yeah, hit us up on the socials at PlayTessie on both Instagram and Twitter. But yeah, for, for Pat, for Sammy, Coop in the background, it's been Gordo here signing off from Play Tessie, episode 46. Toodaloo.